Stand with me now as we read together the 23rd Psalm, beginning in verse 1. Now, by way of reminder, the 23rd Psalm has three stanzas. It's a song, in other words. So I didn't make this up. This isn't my creativity. It's straight in the text. Verses 1 through 3 is the first stanza, and we studied that last week. You'll notice today the second stanza is but one verse. And guess what that means? Our whole sermon today is on but a verse. We're going to look at verse 4 today, and we'll conclude our three-week study next week by, as you might suspect, looking at verses 5 and 6. Let's read with a running start, beginning in verse 1, and we'll read down through verse 4. Hear now the words of our God, as written by David, the psalmist of Israel. Psalm 23, a psalm of David. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff they comfort me. Would you join me as we pray? Father in heaven, we come before you with doubly thankful hearts, not only for the blood of Jesus that makes us redeemed and whole, but for the unique grace we have received as citizens of this great country. And so we plead on behalf of this nation, Lord. We ask that you would show continued mercy towards our government, that you would restore in our national conversation, a reverence for your holy name. We're asking for revival. And as we turn to your word, Lord, I pray that you would open our eyes to behold wonderful things from your word. Grant us the grace to see that which you would have us to see in this immortal, unparalleled psalm. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. You know, we've just heard the greatest, sweetest song ever sung. There is perhaps no song in all God's Bible more sung by saints, or I dare say hung by heathens, than Psalm 23. If the Psalms, the Psalter, is God's psalm book, and if David is God's greatest songwriter, then we ought to conclude that the 23rd Psalm is his greatest hit. There is no psalm like Psalm 23. It is indeed one of the sweetest songs ears could ever hear. Now, last week, we learned the melody of this song, so to speak. You know what a melody is, right? The melody is it's what you hum. It's what you know of a song. Even if you don't know the words, you can kind of hum the melody, and that's how you recognize a song. So too, verses 1 through 3, they kind of serve as the melody of Psalm 23. Most people are generally familiar with, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. It's the melody. But here's the trick about melodies. A melody without a harmony is a little odd. Y'all know what I mean by that? A melody, if sung by itself, is just a little boring. It doesn't seem right. It just seems a little bland. That's why we have a praise team, and we often have a choir and orchestra, because it fills in the symphonic sound. It brings in the full harmony, and it makes this beautiful cacophony of sound. It makes it all the more enjoyable. So, too, Psalm 23, verses 1 through 3, as beautiful and melodic as they are, they seem a little odd by themselves, because here's the hard truth. I wonder how many of you have cynically since last Sunday been thinking, it may be nice that God is my shepherd and he leads me to green pastures and still waters and restores my soul and leads me on right paths, but the hard truth is, pastor, my life is not always green pastures. I often don't feel like I'm enjoying still waters. Do you realize, pastor, that most of the time I feel like I'm in the valley, which is what makes this psalm so sweet? is because this psalm is symphonic. It's harmonic. 
It's not merely the melody of verses one through three. We see the harmony to this beautiful melody in verse four. For verse four illustrates for us the fullness of this psalm. It illustrates for us that Psalm 23 truly is a psalm for every season. For just like a melody without a harmony is lacking, so too a promise from the scripture that God is always gonna lead you to green pastures and still waters, it's lacking when you feel like you're in the valley. And I wonder how many of you this day know that you know that you're in the valley. And so you're excited to hear the harmony. But now here's the trick about harmonies. If a melody without a harmony is odd, a harmony without a melody is a little off. You ever heard a song with just the harmony and not the melody? It doesn't even sound like the song. <laughs> Sounds odd. If the choir were to get up there and you just had the altos and the tenors and the basses singing, the song would sound wacky. You need the sopranos up there to give you the melody, to fill out the sound, to make it knowable. So too, when we sing, or when we read, I should say, verse 4, some of you may think it sounds off. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. And you're thinking, that is just not true. Who could actually say that? Who could sing with assurance, I will fear no evil in the midst of the valley? And the truth is, you will only be able to face tomorrow and sing with assurance, I will not fear. You'll only be able to do that if you learn the melody of verses 1 through 3. And with two hands held together, sing in one accord, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley, I will fear no evil. I want you to see that when we bring this melody and this harmony together, it will sing for us one beautiful song. And let me just summarize it like this. Dear church, come what may, you need not be afraid. Whatever comes your way, you don't need to be afraid. Let's go together with this psalmist, David, the sweetest of psalmists of Israel. Let's go with him into the valley and learn, how could he sing this song? How could he sing both in green pastures and in the valley? Well, remember, he is writing about his story as a shepherd. So we need to go back again and remember the imagery of a shepherd leading his sheep. David was surely in this psalm recollecting his experience leading sheep into a valley. In that day and time, shepherds would often lead their sheep from Jerusalem down to the Jordan River. And to this day, there is a valley that connects Jerusalem and the Jordan River. It's called the Wadi Kelt. Wadi means valley or gulch or gorge in that original language. And you can go into this valley that leads you down into the Jordan River Valley where the sheep would get better pasture, and there's a few features of this valley that David surely saw as he remembers his time in Psalm 23. On the one hand, it was a deep valley. For if you enter to this day, the Wadi Valley, you will notice the stream has cut into the Judean hills. And now there are tall cliff sides on either side of the valley. And so as David walked into this valley leading his sheep, sheep he would see the cliff sides to his left and his right. It was not only a deep valley, it was consequently a dark valley, for the cliff sides would get so high that the sun would often cast a shadow down over the valley, and it seemed like a dark, foreboding place. Not surprisingly then, this dark, deep valley tended to be a dangerous valley. This was a place prone to predators hiding in the cliffs prone to flash floods, rock slides. In fact, most scholars assume that Jesus, in his famed parable of the Good Samaritan, do you all remember that story where the Good Samaritan got beat up and left on the side of the road? Many surmise that that story may have taken place in its setting in this Wadi Kelt, this valley of the shadow of death that David so many years earlier was illustrating. It was a dangerous place. Consequently, this deep, dark, dangerous valley would often lead you to feel deserted in this valley. You would feel all alone. David would surely be guiding his sheep by himself down this narrow pathway. Now, here's the trick. Psalm 23, we need to remember, is not just an education in ancient Near East shepherding. It's not really about that. In fact, you know when, none of what's wild about this psalm. Do you remember? Is David the shepherd in this psalm? 
is not. If you remember, David actually poetically remembers himself not as the shepherd, but as a sheep, illustrating for us that David was in essence recollecting that God as his shepherd had led him through the valleys of his life. And I wonder how many of you find yourself in the valley, so to speak, and resonate with the psalmist of old and say, Pastor, this is a deep valley I'm in. I feel hemmed in on every side. It it feels like there is no escape for me. It's a dark valley. If you only knew the darkness of my soul this hour, I feel despondent, dejected, depressed. It feels like there is no light at the end of the tunnel. I, I feel quite hopeless in this valley. Some of you may object and say, Pastor, say what you want. You don't know how dangerous my valley is. I've been given months to live. My diagnosis is grim. There's no getting out of this valley, and I feel deserted. I feel all alone. I'm in a crowd of over a thousand people, and I feel utterly and completely alone. And if that's you, if you sense acutely that you are in the valley of the shadow of death, I pray you will learn to sing with the psalmist, I will fear no evil. You will be able to leave this house and say with sweet assurance of faith, come what may, I will not be afraid. And here's why. Because in verse 4, we see three reasons why we can sing with David, I will not fear. Three reasons, mark this down firstly, I want you to note One of the reasons we need not fear the valley is because, strangely enough, God led you to this valley. He led you there. Did you notice how verse 4 begins? It says, even though I walked through the valley. Some of you memorize this in the King James. How does that verse begin? Yea, though I walk through the valley. Literally means, yes, even though I walk through this valley, what's he talking about? When he says, even though, he's pointing back to verse 3. And do you remember what he said in verse 3? In verse 3, he poetically said that our good shepherd leads us on paths of righteousness. That literally means right paths. And here's what's so wild. Often, the right path that your good shepherd is leading you on leads straight to the valley. That path is a pathway into the valley. Even though he leads me on these right paths into the valley, I'm going to fear no evil. Have you guys forgotten that God in his goodness often, if not always to one degree or another, leads us into valleys? Perhaps you're immediately thinking, this feels like something unique to me. Sometimes I wonder if God is real because I'm in all these valleys and I feel like he doesn't see, notice he's forgotten me. But just remember that you are in good company, that all of history, both biblical history and church history, in one accord can attest that God in his goodness often leads his saints into the valley. Just as Joseph of the Old Testament, just ask Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, Daniel, all the prophets, just ask the first deacon, Stephen, just ask the incomparable apostle Paul, all of them will in one accord attest, God brought me through trials and tribulations. He led me to them for my good and his glory. So the question is not really, does God do this? Because history proves that he does this. In fact, if you go look at church history, almost all the significant men and women of substance throughout church history, all of them basically have one similar testimony. God brought me into the valley. They almost all will say that. The question is, why? It's a dangerous question to ask, but it's one I trust is in most of your minds and hearts. Why does he do this? Why would God lead any of us into the valley. This is where the imagery of a literal shepherd guiding his sheep becomes instructive for us. Because on the one hand, you need to know if you're an actual shepherd leading sheep, the valley is actually the only way up the mountain. For example, 15 years ago or so, I went to Colorado and I climbed a a 14,000 foot peak there. It's called Challenger Point. It's not the smartest thing. 
And as I was climbing up this mountain with friends, here's what I didn't do. I did not just climb straight up. Do you want to know what path I took? The right path was through the valley. The right path was a valley path that is the best, easiest way to get up to the peak. And, and the truth is, we need to remember that there really is no such thing as a mountain without a valley. If you want to get up the mountain, you need to remember that the evidence of a mountain proves that there's going to be a valley, and that is the only safe way up. Remember, it's really the only way. But if that sounds cold, callous, and cruel of God to design reality that way, that we all must go through a valley to get to the peaks, you need to remember this is where the imagery of a shepherd is just so life-giving. It's not only the only way. It actually is the best way. Because here's what's really interesting about the valley. When a shepherd would lead his sheep into the valley, it was that very valley that tended to have the greenest pasture. It had the most abundant supply of water. Because what does a valley do with the rain? It collects it all. All the rain comes down, and typically there's a stream at the bottom of a valley. And when there is water, what tends to be around water? Greenery. If you all go look at an aerial footage of uh, Egypt, Egypt is nothing but one giant desert, except if you go look down the Nile River, there's this weird band of green, because... Green pastures grow adjacent to water. So too, a shepherd would lead his sheep into valleys and it would counterintuitively be the place where they would find the nourishment they need, the water that they so long for, and consequently, the, the uh, valley also tended to be the gentlest grade. You're not going straight up the mountain. You would go up a gentler path to get to the top. And so that's a good necessary reminder for each of us that ours is a good God who has led us to the valley, and it's not only the only way to the peaks, it really is the best way. He is using this valley to nourish you, to help you get to your final destination, so to speak. This is a principle that most of us are familiar with but don't believe. Are you ready for it? Most of us forget this simple biblical truth that our suffering is never for nothing. That the valley you're presently in is being used of God. He who led you to this valley is using this valley for you. Now here's why. I think it's beautifully caught in a prayer, it's almost a poem, so to speak, that is published in a book called The Valley of Vision. We give this to every new member that joins Hickory Grove, have for the last 10 years or so. And if you have one of these copies, the title poem, the title uh, prayer is the very first one, The Valley of Vision. And it captures in poetic language how God uses suffering in our life. You ready for it? He says something to the effect of, oh God, let me learn by paradox that the way down is the way up. That to be low is to be high. That the contrite spirit is the rejoicing spirit that the repenting soul is the victorious soul, that to give is really to receive, that the valley is the place of vision. Oh, my friends, come what may, you need not be afraid because he has led you to this valley. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, even though you've led me here, I will fear no evil. But don't miss a critical, crucial word in the first part of verse 4. Does verse 4 say, even though I walk to the valley of the shadow of death? Does verse 4 say, even though I walk in the valley of the shadow of death? What does it say? Even though I walk through the valley. Oh, underscore that beautiful word through, because it illustrates for us a truth that I trust will sustain you in the valley. The same God who's led you to this valley, his promise is sure. He will see you through the valley. This valley is not a dead end. This valley is one that will end. Now, the truth is, valleys often seem endless, to us, do they not? 
If that's true for you, if in this moment you acutely feel like you are in a valley and there is no hope, you're never getting out of it, mark in your margin what I believe to be one of the most precious promises in all the New Testament for suffering saints. 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17, this verse has been a balm to my soul time and again. The Apostle Paul reminds us that whatever suffering you're experiencing this moment, whatever your trial or tribulation, whatever your valley, remember, it is but a light, momentary affliction. It will end. This valley, endless as it may seem, is not endless. But perhaps you object and say, okay, I'll grant that it's going to end one day, but the truth is, it may not be endless, but it sure feels aimless. And if your valley feels aimless, pointless, purposeless, don't forget how Paul ends his thought in 2 Corinthians 4 and verse 17. It is not only a light momentary affliction, but he tells us that this light momentary affliction is preparing for us an eternal weight of glory beyond all comparison. Whatever valley you're going through, the Lord is using it to prepare you to go to the other side, to see through it, and to get to your destination. There is a great expanse that awaits you. This valley will not be endless. Praise God, it is not aimless, but maybe it feels that way. You may admit in your mind that this is a true statement, but in your heart, in your gut, it just feels endless and aimless to you. And if that's true for you, perhaps you have the death sentence, so to speak. You've heard from the doctor that your days are numbered. And you're thinking, I, what promise does Psalm 23 have for me in the midst of this crisis? I, I literally, my days are numbered. Like, I can count them. If that's you, oh, I, I want to say this as tenderly as I can. This is a, a good encouragement for each of us. Have you forgotten that in a very real sense, death is not a dead end. It is but a gateway to glory. That death actually, biblically, is gain, Paul says. Just imagine, would you rather go through the valley, get out on the other side, and then realize you still have several miles to go? Or how nice would it be to go through the valley and finally when you turn the corner and you get out of that deep, dark, dangerous valley, you arrive through the gates of glory. Oh, death cannot touch you. Death is not a dead end. This valley is not aimless. He is using it for a purpose in your life. It's not aimless and praise be to God, it is not endless. You may think there is no mountain on the other side. But remember, if it's logical to say that there are no mountains without valleys, it is equally logical for us to conclude there are no valleys without mountains. Which means for you and for me that if you are in a valley this moment, that is proof positive that there is a mountain lurking, that this valley is leading you somewhere. Praise be to God, this valley is not the sum total of your existence. The same God that led you into it, that same God is gonna see you through it. Praise be to God, ours is a good, gracious shepherd who is leading us such that we can sing with full assurance of faith, come what may, I need not be afraid. He's led me here, he's led me to it, and that same God is going to see me through it. And as you go through this valley, I want to encourage you. Did you notice how he goes through the valley? Does it say, even though I run through the valley of the shadow of death, I'll fear no evil? Does it note, even though I stumble through the valley, I'll fear no evil? Even though I trip and fall in the valley, I'll fear no evil? Of course, you know, the word says walk, which I think is a beautiful picture illustrating for us the patience we need as sheep as we follow our shepherd through the valley of the shadow of death. Oh, that you and I would learn to walk. How can we walk, so to speak, patiently with our shepherd? Well, I think just using the word picture, there's a few things I would want to encourage us to do as we go through our valley together. On the one hand, be sure that you are keeping your eyes on the shepherd. Look ahead. Recognize that whatever path you're going on, it's the right path that he is leading you on. Keep your eyes on him. That means you need to be in the book. You, if you want to go through the valley of the shadow of death and fear no evil, it will be impossible if you don't have your eyes on the shepherd, which means your eyes are in this book. 
But don't just look ahead. I want to also invite you to look behind. Because here's the truth. This valley is probably not the first one you've been through, and it won't be the last one. And you should look back and see how far God's taken you. You should look back and recognize, I've actually come a long way, and I'm alive. He's kept me this far. I'm going to trust him to keep leading me out of this. One of the best ways I know how to do this is through journaling. On my 34th birthday, I began journaling. And when I did, I, I've actually journaled every single day since I turned 34. And this has been prayers that I write to the Lord. And the main reason I do it is because it gives me a written record of how good God has been to me. Any of you forgetful like me, where you've totally forgot what God has done in your life? Completely forget. I go back and I read old stuff. I was just recently reading something from October of last year, and I had utterly forgotten about that great uh, burden on my heart. And I saw how good God had been to me, taking me through it. I want to commend to you, don't just look ahead to your shepherd by being in the book. Look back to your shepherd and record what he's done for you. And as you journey, don't just look ahead and behind. But I invite you also to look around and remember that there are lessons to be learned in this valley, that this shepherd... He has led you here for a reason. He's using this valley in your life. So don't just look, uh, walk through it with your eyes closed. Look around and recognize he is teaching you now. Oh, he's led you to it. Oh, he'll see you through it. But perhaps you must confess with me, be that as it may, you just want to close your eyes because you're afraid. You don't like it. You hate it. All, everything about it is scary to you. It really is deep and dark and dangerous and yeah, you can mentally assent that he's leading you, but the truth is you're, you're just scared. You just want to hold his hand and close your eyes. And if that's you, may I remind you one third and final precious truth. Notice how the verse ends. It says, even though I walk through the valley, I'll fear no evil. Why? For you are with me. Your rod and staff comfort me. Let's put it in language that makes sense in our message. The same God that has led you into this valley, the same God that is seeing you through this valley, it is that same good shepherd who is with you in the valley. He is with you, dear church. Oh, praise God that you are not actually deserted in this dark, dangerous, deep valley. He is with you. His rod and his staff comfort you. Let's pick apart the imagery of this psalm. For him to say he is with you means this. He is beside you. He is walking alongside you. In fact, the pronouns even get personal. And he stops talking about him as a faraway object. And he says, you are with me. You. The psalmist is as intimate and near as possible here. And he's saying, God, you are my shepherd right by my side. You are walking with me through this valley, which is a great hope for we in the valley of the shadow of death, poetically speaking. There is a God who has promised you that he will never leave you or forsake you. You are not abandoned, forsaken, forgotten. He is beside you this moment, but he is not merely beside you. This same shepherd who is beside you is also behind you. For notice what the psalm says is in his hand. It says his rod comforts. The rod was a roughly two foot long wooden object carved from oak that shepherds would fashion to help guard and protect the sheep. They would use it to throw at predators. They would use it to uh, discipline the sheep to protect them from, from problems. So too, there is a good God whose rod, metaphorically speaking, ought to comfort you. For ours is a good God who is behind you, guarding you, so to speak, protecting you, so to speak, from the evil one. You may be pressed, but not crushed. Persecuted, not abandoned. You may be struck down, but Paul tells us you will not be destroyed. For you have a shepherd who is not only beside you, but he is behind you. His rod ought to comfort you. But notice his hands are full. For he not only has a rod in his hand, he also is wielding a staff, which illustrates for us that the same shepherd who guards you with his rod guides you with his staff. The same shepherd that protects you with his rod, he is directing you with his staff. He is not only beside you and behind you, he is in a very real sense before you. 
leading the way. The same God that says, I will never leave you or forsake you, beside you. The same God who says, you're going to be pressed but not crushed, persecuted, not abandoned. The one who is behind you. That same God is in front of you and he is saying, this is the way. Walk in it. I know it doesn't look like the way. I know you'd rather turn around and run, but follow me. Trust me, this is the way. My rod and my staff, they ought to comfort you. And so take heart, dear church. If you can just learn the comfort that comes with the presence of God, oh, so much will change. There will be peace that makes no sense filling your heart. Just consider why a child runs into the arms of their mother when the thunderbolt crashes in the middle of the night. Perhaps that happened this week. It did in my house. Why does that child run from their bedroom into your room? It's because there is something about a mother's arms. Her presence provides peace. How many of you have been in a hospital room and there's just something about the closeness of a loved one at your bedside that just brings you unusual comfort? What are they actually doing for you? They can't fix it. They're not doctors. But is there not just an unusual comfort that comes with them at your side? Oh, do you see illustrated for us the comfort that comes with the rod and the staff of our good God? The God who has led you into this valley is the same God who will see you through this valley. And even though this valley is deep, dark, and dangerous, you need not fear because he is going to stay with you through this valley. And so, come what may, you need not be afraid. But if this just doesn't sound right to you, perhaps this whole message has just seemed a little off. It's like there's a note that's wrong. It's grating to you. You ever listen to a live song and you're like, something's not right. There's like a note off. Either a note's missing or the wrong note is being played. If you play piano, you know just one key off can change the whole sound of the chord and it's not going to sound right. Maybe there's a note that just sounds off to you about this. You want to be able to sing with the psalmist, come what may, I'll never be afraid, but you just know that, I don't know that that's going to happen. If that's true for you, I wonder if this note is what's off for you. I wonder if this one key is being wrongly played in your heart this moment. Even though I walk through the valley of death, I will fear no evil. Did you catch it? Did you notice the missing note? Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. What is this shadow of which he speaks? Just a few weeks ago, I was flying into Charlotte from New York. And as I was making our, we were making our approach into the airport, I noticed the shadow of the airplane being cast down onto the city landscape. And as we were approaching, you boys and girls, listen to this, youngest in the room, as the shadow was falling over the city, it started to hit houses, bam, 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 crushing houses. And as the shadow of that plane was hitting trees, trees were toppling left, right, left. Is that true? Of course, you boys and girls know that that's ridiculous. Can a shadow do that? Does the shadow have the ability to do anything of the sort? And of course, the answer is, of course not. Shadows, they may alarm you, but they can't harm you. They may scare you, but they're not going to scathe you. A A shadow isn't able to do that which it is well shadowing. For example, how many of you in this room have ever been bit by the shadow of a snake? Any of you all ever been crushed by the shadow of a stone? Any of you all ever been pierced by the shadow of a sword? How much more than could any of us be killed by the shadow of death? The reason... Just wait. There's something worth clapping about in a moment. The reason we need not fear the shadow is because... The substance of that shadow bit, crushed, pierced, and killed Jesus. Do you realize this? 
that the reason we need not fear the valley of the shadow of death is because Jesus literally walked through the valley of death so that we would only have to go through the valley of the shadow of it. We need not fear the valley of the shadow because that snake, that ancient serpent, he bit Jesus, bruised his heel, as Genesis 3 said. It, we need not fear the shadow of that stone crushing because the literal stone crushed Christ on the cross. We need not fear the shadow of the sword because the literal sword is what pierced his side. We need not fear death because when Jesus died, guess what? Death died with him. He walked through the valley of death so that we wouldn't have to. And that same Jesus that died and with him death died too, this same Jesus rose. And when he rose, guess what rose with him? Light at last dawned on all of God's green earth. And as that light is shining in the souls of God's uh, people, it's going to cast shadows of this fallen creation on your heart. And you're going to see the shadows of the valley of death Deep, dark, dangerous as they may seem, you don't have to fear them because death can't touch you. Jesus died so that you would not. So together, can we not now, looking at Christ, our great, good, chief shepherd, say and sing with David with full assurance of faith, come what may, I don't need to be afraid because he's with me. I don't need to be afraid because he's led me here. I don't need to be afraid because he's promised to see me through this valley. Can we not sing this psalm that has been a comfort to so many for so long? The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I am going to fear no evil. For you, my God, are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. Oh, what sweet words we ought to sing in unison. Come what may, we need not be afraid. Would you join me as we pray? With your heads bowed as we go to the Lord in a time of commitment, perhaps those words, soul-stirring as they may strike you in the moment, you're afraid that that tune is going to fade in just an hour. And this evening, you're going to find yourself back in the valley, fearing the dark, deep, dangerous shadows if that's you, I want to plead with you as we sing in just a moment. Now is the time, divinely appointed, that you cry out to your good shepherd who has led you to this valley, has promised to see you through it, and is with you presently in it. You cry out to him and ask him to open your eyes to look to him. Ask him to open your eyes to look back and see how far he's taken you. Ask him to open your eyes to look around and learn the lessons that he is teaching you through it. Perhaps you need help. You need somebody to help show you. There's pastors down here at the front. They're here to talk with you. You come in a moment. Perhaps you'd like to come and pray at these steps or you'd like somebody to pray with. I and the rest of the team are here and we know no greater privilege than to pray with you. After I pray, we'll stand and sing. And when we do, the invitation to you is to come. Father in heaven, I'm asking that by the power of your spirit, and to the glory of Jesus Christ, our great chief, good shepherd, that you would open our eyes to see the truth that alone will help us to sing. Come what may, we need not be afraid, for you are our shepherd who has led us to this valley. You are our shepherd who will see us through this valley. And you are our shepherd who are, who is with us in this valley. Even though we walk through this valley of the shadow of death, we will fear no evil. For you, O oh God, are with us. And your rod and staff, praise God, they comfort us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Would you stand to your feet? And as we stand and as we sing, the call to you this day is to come.